Well, hello and welcome along to another one of Al's Geek Labs. Today on the Geek Lab, I'm going to step you through networking with Ms. Doss. Oh, MS-DOS, that's right. And um, so, how do we do this? Well, usually, setting up networking on MS-DOS is about as fun as sticking your head in the washing machine and switching on to Maxi Wash Cycle. Today, I'm going to be showing you 10 steps in true YouTube fashion in how to make it a breeze. Well, when I say a breeze, I mean something between hurricane level and a light wind. Okay. But trust me, it's all coming up here on Al's Geek Lab. Stay tuned. So nowadays, we're used to networking being plug and play, but with DOS-based PCs, networking can often become not working. Fortunately, there are a bunch of new apps and drivers out there, including ones made in 2020. That makes life a lot more palatable, so I'm going to talk you through all of the steps so you can get your old bit of vintage kit kicking and screaming into the second decade of the 21st century, or maybe at least the 1990s. First things first, you may be wondering why in the hell I'd even want to do networking on my old bit of kit. Well, firstly, here's a few things that I would use as a networking setup. One, I could transfer files via FTP from my new laptop to my old retro pieces of kit. Secondly, I could connect it to my Raspberry Pi, and that runs Linux. I can then do a whole host of useful things like run text mode web browsers, email clients, and also Twitter as well, things like that. I'll show you that later. Uh, I could also use IRC chat uh, to chat with fellow geeks. <clears throat> I mean, really nice, normal people on the internet. Uh, and then uh, I could also use text mode web browsers natively to surf the web. I could also connect to awesome bulletin board systems or BBSs as you may know them and chat with people and play online games. I could maybe use SSH, and that's a big maybe, so we'll see if we can get that working later on. And then finally, I could use Telnet to connect to other online services or perform network diagnostics with tools such as Netcat and Ping. There are literally heaps of other cool things that you can do with a machine that was made way before the World Wide Web even existed. But I don't all want you thinking this is DOS based only. You can check my channel out for some really old videos that I've done and you'll see I've done similar things with, uh, with computers such as the Apple II. But however, I'm basing this video on using it with an IBM PC with at least 256K of RAM and an 8088 or better processor. So, you think this all sounds rather great? It's, uh, well, if you do, then you've got to check your head. But there's one born every minute, as they say. But who am I to judge? Let's get on with it. So now that you're along for the ride, here's the main steps to this journey in true YouTube countdown fashion. Number 10. Get yourself a network card or a simulated adapter that will work with MS-DOS and Michael Brutman's MTCP software. More on that later. Number 9. Install the network card into your PC. All of those lovely jumpers. And no, I'm not talking about those woolen things you get at Christmas time here. Number 8. Download the network packet driver for your network card. Number 7. Download the MTCP software. Number 6. Copy the packet driver and the MTCP software to your retro PC. This sounds really easy, doesn't it? Number five, copy the packet driver. Number four, configure the MTCP software. Number three, get an IP with DHCP. Number two, optionally, make a wee batch file to set it up every time that you start your computer. And number one, have lots of networky fun, of course. Set up Telnet D, of course.
So, without further ado, let's get on with it. Step one, get your network card sorted. Before we really get rolling though, here's a few terminologies that might help you out. LAN, or Local Area Network, is a network that consists of one or more computers. It's effectively just a big piece of cable that goes between computer to computer. It uses network adapters in each computer to talk to one another. Next up is Router or Gateway. For a LAN to speak to another network, also including the internet, you need to use a router. It's also known as a gateway. Your LAN effectively plugs in to the router and then transmits and receives traffic to the other networks outside of your LAN. Ethernet. Ethernet is a standard which was devised many years ago. An Ethernet card is an interface to your LAN. It's either a card inside your computer's expansion slots or in more modern PCs or laptops, it's integrated into the motherboard in a chip. Either way, it'll have some sort of connector on the inside of the computer. Ethernet adapters usually have an RJ45 style connector, which you're probably familiar with. It kind of looks like a phone jack. But back in the old days, there was BNC and AUI type connectors too. So be aware of that. You want to make sure that you've got a network card with an RJ45 if you're plugging into a modern network. Next up is MAC addresses. Every Ethernet card has what's called a MAC address. Uber Eats don't deliver burgers to that address and it has nothing to do with Apple Macs, I can assure you. MAC stands for Media Access Control Address. An Ethernet card has a MAC address which is unique for every single Ethernet card in the world. No two can ever be the same. Note that this is not the same as an IP address. Networks use a protocol or language called ARP, which stands for Address Resolution Protocol, in order to assign IP addresses to the MAC address of a network card. That way, everyone on the network knows which network card goes to which IP address. It's kind of like what DNS does for network cards, if you know what DNS is. Network packets. Network packets are the way that information is sent across the network. If you sent all the information you wanted to send across the network in one go, it means you get an awful lot of congestion on the network. Think three nights drinking the Guinness non-stop and you're getting somewhere close. Thanks to packets and Ethernet frames, this situation is mitigated. The information you send on your network is chopped up into packets. They are between 72 and 1526 bytes in size. Next up is Wi-Fi. Everybody's familiar with Wi-Fi. It's a wireless version of Ethernet. It's still got a MAC address, it's got an IP address, and so forth. Well, I've gone on about that dry theory long enough. I've told you all this guff, so you know what I'm talking about later on in the video. So when I tell you your gateway is eating your MAC, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, kinda. So now you're armed with all of this good knowledge, you'll need to get yourself a network card, also known as an Ethernet adapter. If you haven't already gotten one, here are some ideal Ethernet adapters that are known to work with this solution. The 3COM 3C503 and the 3C509. The Zircom PE310BT, which is a parallel port adapter. And Novell NE1000, NE2000 and its clones. The Western Digital or SMC8003 series. The Intel Aether Express 8-16. The Davicom DM908F the Linksys PCI cards, and of course the slip slash PPP connections using the Ether slip. This basically emulates Ethernet using a serial or modem connection. Hopefully, by the time you've rewatched this video, convinced yourself that DOS networking is for you, subscribed to my channel and thumbs up this very video, shameless plug, then you'll be good and you'll be the proud owner of an old network card which has drivers for your DOS-based retro PC. Let's get cracking. Right, step two, install that network card into your PC. I myself have a 3Com 3C503. Here's a quick look at my card. So this is my card here. I thought I'd just uh, give it a quick show and tell. Uh, there are many other cards out there that will work with DOS, but I thought this card is a uh, I went for this card myself, knowing that it works really well with DOS. It is a 3COM Etherlink 2, 
uh, 3C503-16 TP to be precise. So the 3C503 is well known to be uh, a good one. So it's an Ethernet card, just to be precise. It's got the AUI transceiver type connector, but more importantly, it's got Ethernet. Obviously, you get 10 base T, which has um, sort of BNC connector. So ideally, you want something with Ethernet so it plugs straight into a, a modern network. All right, so there's a few things you need to know about this card. Obviously, if you have another card, things will probably be similar, but obviously not the same. The jumper settings are the main thing to watch out for. So on this card, if you do have the same card, fantastic. Here, I'll just talk you through it briefly. This area here is for where you would have a BIOS. So you'd have a chip in here, and the BIOS would allow you to do things like network boots. So it's a little mini operating system, I guess, in here. And then there's one, two, three sets of jumpers. At the top is the IO base address. So this is basically the area in RAM where you'll um, address this card. So this one here is set for two, eight, uh, 250, rather. So it's 250H is where this card is accessed. And then this, this is also a memory address and this starts at C8000 all the way down to DC1000. And at the moment you can see that this is set to the disabled position. This is the memory address of the BIOS itself. So obviously as there's no BIOS, the setting is disabled. And unless you have a good reason to be needing a BIOS, I'd recommend disabling it. Uh, because if you want to enable or use other areas of RAM in your machine above that 640K, bear in mind that um, that will limit that space because it's also be, it's going to be used by the BIOS here. Uh, finally, there's a jumper down here, I think this is JP5, and this allows you to choose between 8 and 16. Now I have a PCXT, this is a completely 8-bit bus, so I only have cards that will fit in an 8-bit slot, like this one here. You can see quite clearly, 8-bit slot, but this card here, and by its designation being a 16, it's a 16-bit card. So how does that work? Well, that's what this jumper comes in for. It actually switches the card from 8-bit operation to 16-bit, obviously, and vice versa. And the good thing about this, uh, the design of the ISA or EISA standard was that if cards supported 8-bit and 16-bit, you had this little notch in them that allowed this bit just to hang over the edge of the 8-bit um, the uh, side of it. So it works perfectly fine as an 8-bit card. So Kudos to 3Com for thinking about the types of users that might have used this card in the past. And there you go, that's 3C503. You saw all of those jumper settings on that card. If you want to find the jumper settings layout for your card, have a look at this website, it's called statson.org. It's probably got what you're after. So the main thing to do is set the IO base address of the card the area and RAM where your computer can talk to the Ethernet card. Take a note of the setting and pop that card inside your retro PC. As you saw, my card is set to address 250H. Make sure that whatever address you set your card to, it doesn't overlap with the address of any other card in your PC. Otherwise, bad things will happen. Next, what you've got to do is grab the packet driver. Well, what does a packet driver do, I, I hear you ask? A packet driver drives packets, of course. Well, no. As per a modern day, a driver, or a device driver as it's properly known, is just a piece of software to make a piece of hardware work in the way it's intended. Without a device driver, the computer wouldn't know how to operate the device. You may recall me earlier talking about what a network packet is. On this network, we want to use IP packets, most probably combined with TCP, or UDP. So the reason that's called a packet driver, the driver is telling the Ethernet card how to handle Ethernet packets. Making sense? No? Never mind. Nobody really cares anyway. To get the packet driver, you probably want to go to a network called the Internet. On that network, there's a thing called the World Wide Web. You'll be able to use this tool to visit a web site like kernwinner.com, C-R-N-W-I-N-N-E-R, 
y-n-w-r.com. Anyway, don't worry about it. You'll find all the uh, websites for all of this stuff in the show's description. Hopefully, ye shall find the MS-DOS drivers for the network card that you have in your grubby little mitts. Next step is step four, download the NTCP software. Still on that interconnected network there? Good, you'll be able to visit a website called brutman.com. Now, I cannot stress this point enough. Michael Brutman is a genius. He developed a whole suite of modern day TCP applications for DOS. His goal was to make these applications work on an IBM PC with 4.77 MHz CPU or better, and not only do that, get it all working in 256K of RAM. When you think about all of the overhead that modern network apps have, fitting it into anywhere between 96 and 256K of RAM is some pretty clever stuff. The apps that you'll find on this one megabyte bundle include an FTP client to transfer files either between your local network or over the internet. FTP SRV is an FTP server which I mainly use to transfer files to my retro PCs. Then there's Telnet and this allows you to connect to remote servers and services. For example, I have a Raspberry Pi with the Telnet D server on it. When I Telnet into the Raspberry Pi, which is a Linux box, I can use it for many applications such as Twitter, text-based web browsers and email clients. With Telnet you can also connect to old school BBSs. I'll give you some more information on that later on. Next up there's IRC Junior, which is an IRC client so you can get your chat on with other IRC users on the net. Next, HTTP Serve, which is a web server so you can serve up web pages from your retro PC. Crazy, I know. Then there's HTTP Get. This tool allows you to download raw web pages, kind of like wget or curl if you know them in the Linux space. Next, there's Netcat, which is the utility which allows you to send any raw data over the network. Then there's some more rudimentary network tools, which are DHCP. And just in case you don't know, this is the protocol that gives you your IP address. It means you don't have to statically assign one. Next up, Packet Tool, a packet sniffer and diagnostic tool for packet drivers. And finally, SNTP. It sets the clock on your PC using internet time servers with the network time protocol. The MTCP apps are the most common out there, being released in January of 2020. However, there are plenty of other apps which are still worth a whirl. I'll do a little bit of coverage on these ones later. For example, Threads DOS Internet Software, which includes the DOS Link web browser and SSH DOS, the SSH client for DOS. Step 5. Transferring the files. Alright, is this a case of chicken and egg? How do we get our networking software onto our old PC without having a network? Well, I have a few options for you. Let's try this one first. So if your new computer that you want to transfer the files from has just a USB port, then you can use one of these, hopefully. This is a USB cable, this is a floppy disk drive. If you have a three and a half inch floppy disk drive on your old computer, then this is probably the easiest method. Copy the MTCP and the packet driver onto the floppy disk, take said floppy disk out of this drive, and then put it into the floppy disk drive of your old computer. Job is a good one. If that's not an option for you, then this could be an option. It's got an RS-232 cable on the far end and a USB cable on the other end. This allows you to transfer files from your new computer to your old computer via USB and then into RS-232 port on the old side. So just a fairly straightforward null modem cable. This, um, this one, the model is HXSP-2108D. You can pick it up anyway on Amazon for about 15 bucks. If, however, your old computer and your new computer have a serial port, 
or RS-232 as it's some kind, it call, sometimes called, then you'll find that you have one or, one or both of these types of cables, uh, connectors, sorry, on your machines. So you probably find that your PC, your new PC, has to be about 10 plus years old to have a serial port on it. So if it doesn't have a serial port, then then you probably find the other two options work. But this one here is like a, uh, it's called a null modem cable. That just basically means that the receive and the transmit wires are twisted round in the middle of the cable. And uh, you can choose on this cable, it's quite handy. It's got both the 25, the DB25, and the DB9 connectors so that if you only have one of them, not the other, you can use either. So it's pretty handy, but it's called null modem cable. And this is nice and long to make sure it stretches from both your computers. So that's your final option if you're using a slightly older computer to your retro computer. If you don't have a floppy disk drive and you go with the cable option, then Interlink is probably your friend. Interlink and its counterpart Interserver comes pre-installed with MS-DOS, version 6 and up. Note that if you want to use this method, you'll need to be running MS-DOS on both computers. If you're using Windows 10 or similar, there's no MS-DOS support, but running a DOS-based VM in VirtualBox might work. I've put a link to MS-DOS VirtualBox images in the description. Now, if you've got Interlink in your DOS directory on both computers, then simply plug in the cable and then the following steps will sort you out. If you don't have Interlink on your old computer, then you'll need to transfer it by using the slash rcopy method first. Here's how you use Interlink, assuming that you have it on both your old computer and your new PC. First, you'll need to configure the device driver in your config sys. To do that, enter the line device equals c colon backslash dos backslash inter lnk dot exe in a space forward slash com colon one. Put that in your config sys file and then edit your auto exec bat and enter c colon backslash dos backslash inter svr dot exe. This all assumes that you have these files in c colon backslash dos and that you're using the com1 or serial port for your configuration. Now you can use your printer port or LPT port if you're using a parallel cable. Reboot both machines now, run enter svr on your new computer in the directory that you want to transfer the files from and then run enter lnk on your old computer ready to receive. If you don't have Interlink on your old computer, then type in the following at the DOS prompt on the new computer. Inter SVR forward slash R copy. Then type the following on the old computer. Mode space com1 colon 2400 comma n comma 8 comma 1 comma p. And then another command cttty space com1 inter server and interlink will be copied to the old computer and you can proceed as before alternatives to the interlink software include the sesame street character kermit i mean the popular terminal emulator and file transfer application of the 80s and 90s obviously luckily i found that lying on a floppy disk somewhere before don't forget Laplink Pro or Norton Commander either. A slightly newer program, FileMaven, supports Windows. Finally, you can use PPP to transfer files over a fake network from Windows 10 or a Linux VM if you have no luck with the above options. The stages required are a little bit more complex but do work, so I've linked them in the description. Now it's time for step 6, configure the packet driver. Depending on which network card you have, you'll need to set up the software interrupt number, the IRQ, and the IO address. But newer cards such as the 3C509 only require the software interrupt number. A common software interrupt number is 0 times 60 The configuration for the 3C503 adapter is 3C503, 0 times 60 3, 0 times 250 1 
This means the software interrupt is 0 times 60, the IRQ is 3, and the IO address is 0 times 250. The number 1 at the end is to force the driver to use the RJ45 transceiver, although that's probably not necessary. Next is step 7, configure the MTCP software. Once you've unzipped the MTCP software, I put mine in the directory called net on the C drive, you'll find a subdirectory called samples. In there you'll find two files, ftppass.txt and sample.cfg. Make a copy of sample.cfg in the main TCP directory by typing copy sample.cfg dot dot backslash mtcp.cfg or something like that. You'll also want this ftppass.txt file probably in your root directory. So do so like so. Copy ftppass.txt c colon backslash and edit that file by typing edit c colon backslash net backslash mtcp.cfg. You'll see that there's a few options that you can change. First up, there's the packet interrupt setting. By default, it's set at 0 times 60. If you chose anything else different in step 5, then change the value here. Hostname is set to my DOS machine. Feel free to change this to something that you prefer. If you're going to use IRC Junior IRC chat client, then choose a nickname, a username and your real name that you would like to use for the following options listed there. There are also a few other configurable options for IRC Junior that you can tweak if you want. I left them alone, however. Going down the file further, there's a line that reads FTP SRV password file. It's commented out with a hash. Remove the hash. Unless you're going to set a static IP address, you can save the file and exit your editor. If you're going to set a static IP address, then you can change the entries at the bottom of the file. Make sure that you choose an IP address that doesn't conflict with any other IP addresses on your network. If you can, reserve an IP address or a few IP addresses to use statically. To do this, you'll need to go into your router's admin control panel. It's usually a web page on an IP address something like 192.168.1.1. Once in there, you can probably look for an, a DHCP setting area. It'll often reserve the entire range of IP addresses, e.g. 192.168.1.2 through 192.168.1.254 so you could perhaps change the reserved range between 192.168.1.2 through 192.168.1.250 that would give you four IPs for static assignment. Next you're going to want to edit the file c colon backslash ftp pass dot txt. All you want to do is set up a user and probably just allow full access to your computer's C drive. In the example here I've set up a user called Al's Geek Lab with a password of just password, allowing all access. Finally, you want to tell your computer where MTCP is located on your computer. So type edit c colon backslash autoexec bat and the following line at the end of the file. Set MTCP CFG equals c colon backslash net backslash MTCP dot CFG. Step 8 get an IP address with DHCP. We're on the home stretch now everyone, so reboot your computer and fingers crossed both the packet driver and the MTCP software are now ready to go. Start your packet driver as you did before and then hopefully you get no errors. If not, let's proceed to set up your IP address. If you chose to automatically get an IP address from your router, then you can use DHCP.exe uh, to get sorted and this is probably what you want. For example, type cd backslash net and then type dhcp. Any luck, after a few seconds, you'll be offered an IP address by your router. You'll see it, your assigned IP address, which you may want to take note of. And then you'll see a message saying, good news everyone. Obviously, Michael Brutman knows what a chore IP networking in DOS is. If you set a static IP address, you don't need to do anything at this point. DHCP is not required and the MTCP programs should just work. To test MTCP, try running htget just to test it out. For example, htget http colon slash slash www.brutman.com. After a few seconds, it should just show you the raw HTML text of Michael Brutman's homepage. If you've got problems, 
have a look at the output of the PC starting up. Did the packet driver make any wobbles when it was starting up? Perhaps you didn't set the packet driver settings to match the jumper settings on your card. If your packet driver loaded OK, but DHCP failed to get an IP address, do the usual stuff. Is the network cable plugged in at both the router and the PC? Is the link light on on both? If all of that looks right, try running the MTCP tool called Packet Tool or PKT Tool. Type in PKT Tool Scan at the DOS prompt. If it doesn't find the packet driver, then look at the mtcp.cfg file again and make sure you set the software interrupt setting correctly. If it finds the packet driver, then run PKT Tool Stats 0x60, where 0x60 is the software interrupt that you set earlier on. If you see lots of errors or lost packets, then you'll know there's something bad on the network. Maybe a dodgy cable, network card, something like that. Finally, if you set a static IP address in the mtcp.cfg file, does it work then? Perhaps your router doesn't want to provide IP addresses via DHCP. You'll need to look into your router's configuration for that. Step 9. Setting up a batch file to start your networking. Now, I assume that everything went well with the previous step, so you can make a little batch file to set up everything automatically for you, so you don't have to remember everything. Now, I don't put this in autoexec.bat simply because I don't always use network software, so I want to keep my RAM free for other programs. I made a simple batch file called gotcp.bat. Here's the contents. Step 10. Have lots of networky fun. This is the part that you've been waiting for after all this effort, so now let's check everything out. Now that MTCP is working, there's lots of things that you can do, as I've said before. The most important is the ability to easily get files from your new computer to your old computer over the network. Therefore, let's check out FTP. I downloaded FileZilla on my PC, which is a free FTP client. Now this may be a little bit hard to see, but just for uh, example's sake, on the left here we have an old retro machine and it's uh, showing my current IP address which was leased to it by DHCP as 192.168.1.73. Now I'll start up the FTP SRV file which is the Michael Brutman FTP server. It's found the config file, the FTP pass.txt file everything looks reasonable it says and it's serving it up on 192.168.73 so far so good and then on the right hand side here is a modern PC and I'll try and connect to the machine here so I've just set it up with my uh, host 192.168.1.73 and the username and password which I have configured in the FTP pass.txt file one thing to note is that you have to use um, plain FTP which as it says here is insecure that's okay we're only doing it across our own le local network so let's not worry about that press connect and hopefully you get that little beep from your um, your old PC and then we can see there's now drive C on the right hand side this is showing the uh, the hard disk drive of the old PC on the left hand side we're seeing the hard disk drive of our new PC. So we just go into drive C there and hopefully we get all the files which are in the drive C. Indeed we do. And then I want to go in and I would like to go into the drivers folder because I have some drivers over here I would like to transfer over. So it's as simple as dragging and dropping the files that you would like to have. So I'll just drag this file here and the file, file transfer is finished. Obviously, you might need to tweak the settings, might need to tweak the transfer size, um, the speed and so forth, if you're finding uh, you're getting a loss of, um, loss of quality or, 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 or errors or so forth. The FTP serve tool is probably the MTCP tool that I use the most, simply because I'm always transferring DOS games and apps that I download from the net onto my old PC. So that was FTP serve. Next up is the FTP tool. It's equivalent to FileZilla for your old PC, except it's command line driven. Use commands like dir to show directories, cd to change directories and get to download files. 
I have a lot of fun with IRC Junior talking to people in the vintage computing VC forum on slashnet.org. There are around 600 IRC chat networks and hundreds of thousands of chat channels still in operation today. Typically, 400,000 people use IRC every day. There are chat channels on pretty much any subject. So if you don't already use IRC, what's not to love about getting your chat on with people across the world, all from the uber geekiness of a DOS-based IRC client on your retro PC? Telnet is the father of its secure son, SSH, Secure Shell. Both are most commonly used to connect to remote servers. Back in the day, you could connect to any old server, mainly Unix servers, via Telnet. However, you can actually connect to any service on the net by Telnetting to its port. For example, you can connect to the website google.com simply by typing telnetgoogle.com 80. After you connect, you can enter raw HTTP requests such as get slash and you'll see the home or root page of google.com. Telnet today still serves as a great debugging tool. However, the use cases for it in our lovely little retro world include connecting to remote BBSs, telnetting to my own Linux box to access further services, and so forth. Really, the use of Telnet is limited by your imagination only. Note that most Unix servers that used to accept Telnet connections have now switched to use an encrypted channel using SSH. Let's have a look at an example of telnetting to a BBS. But firstly, what is a BBS? BBS stands for Bulletin Board System. Needless to say, I wasted, mm, invested a lot of my youth on Bulletin Board Systems. This was in the days before the internet went mainstream. Before the internet, people had always wanted to be social via electronic means, whether it was telegraph, telephone or CB radio. In the early 80s, the availability of modems running over the standard copper wire telephone lines became relatively popular. Mostly, these were used for communicating with businesses' mainframes. However, before long, hobbyists made software called bulletin board systems that at their most basic allowed users to write public and private messages to other users that would dial in. Then primitive versions of email started, and later interactive chat, and then what became known as doors, which were additional plugins for BBSs that offered games and other applications. In some ways, BBSs were much more community focused than the internet. People formed close friendships, would chat on phones as well as online. After the internet came along, BBSs started to slow down. The internet took communications global, which was something that was difficult to make practical over the loosely knit BBS infrastructure. However, there was something to be said for those killer ANSI graphics as you can see here. There were great games like Legend of the Red Dragon that really made you use your imagination and the Fido email service that keep, kept me going back for more, even after the internet which was well established by then. Today, these old school BBSs are still available. Some of them you can even still dial up with an old school modem over a telephone line. However, most have internet connection versions that you can reach with Telnet. Have a look at telnetbbsguide.com for a list of operational BBSs out there and have some fun. There are hundreds of them. I have a few Raspberry Pis kicking around my house. If you don't have one, they're cheap, they're around $100 or less, and they're around the size of a credit card. My MFM drive and my XT died many a year ago, so nowadays I use a compact flash card on my XT as the replacement hard drive. So I've got masses of space left in the case where the hard drive used to be. So I put a Raspberry Pi in there and set it up with Telnet D, which is the Telnet server, or daemon, so that I could connect to it and have all the fun. Now here's a demo of web browsing with Elynx, Lynx, W3M and finally Lynx, L-Y-N-X. And these are four different text mode web browsers. You can see a quick comparison here. Then there's other programs such as email software, Pine and this one shown here, Mutt. And finally a program called Sup as well. For Twitter, there's a few command line clients, but I use OISTTER, 
There's also the very lovely rainbow stream too, but I don't find that really works very well in, in the Telnet session. If I want to get my daily fix of Reddit, there's the client RTV. Uh, Facebook, if I want to use Facebook, I just use the mobile version uh, with W3M. If I want to look at images, I can install Kaka View, which is an ASCII text mode image viewer. And yes, if you want to watch a video in text mode, you can. AA Zine helps you do that. Here's a slew more of applications that you would find really handy. The text mode editors Vim and Nano, music players CMUS, CMUS, MP3 Blaster, Mock, Harry, Og123, MPG123, Sox and NMPCPP. All of those are good music players. There's BitTorrent. The client there is called CTorrent. Instant Messenger, which is included in the package Pigeon, is called Finch. IRC, of course, we've got IRSSI and WeChat. For file management, there's the Midnight Commander, which is MC. Sound Mixer and Volume is Alsa Mixer. The Network Monitor, IPTRAF. The Video Encoder, FFmpeg. Image Conversion with Image Magic's Convert Utility. An RSS Reader called Canto. The Clock, which is TTY Clock. Word processing using AntiWord, WordGrinder, and Pandoc, which does Microsoft Word doc conversion. Spreadsheet, SC. Presentation, yeah, just like PowerPoint, but for text mode, there is TPP. A calculator, BC. Finally, you can manage multiple windows with tools such as Tmux, Screen, and you can manage those with BioBU. That's BYOBU. To set up Telnet-D on your Linux box, firstly SSH into it as usual, then issue the following commands. Install with sudo apt-get install telnet-d-y and on CentOS or RHEL you can do this with sudo yum install telnet-server and then enable the service with systemctl start telnet.socket and systemctl enable telnet.socket. You may need to also unblock Telnet on the firewall. You can do so like this. In Ubuntu, sudo ufw allow 23 forward slash tcp. On CentOS, sudo firewall dash command dash dash permanent dash dash add port equals 23 forward slash tcp. And also sudo firewall dash command dash dash reload. If you have an older or another type of Linux, you may need to use xinetd or some other method. Check with your particular distribution's documentation. If you're using xinetd, check that you have a telnet entry in etc. xinetd.d. If you don't, here's an example entry assuming that you have installed the telnet server daemon. You'll need to restart xinetd by typing sudo service xinetd restart or similar. If you have everything set up correctly, you should now be able to telnet to your Linux box by typing telnet and then the hostname or IP address of the Linux box. Now, a word to the wise, I've configured the Raspberry Pi to run Telnet D so I could do all of this fun stuff. But please remember that Telnet is a clear text protocol. Unlike its offspring SSH, which is encrypted, any information sent between the Telnet server and the Telnet client can be seen with a simple packet sniffer application. If it's used on the same network, it's okay, but treat all of the information, for example, passwords, as if they were sent on the back of a postcard. Of course, it is possible to browse that big old World Wide Web using a web browser in MS-DOS, rather than going through a Linux Telnet jump host. If you're on some old hardware like an 8088, then be prepared to wait for a long time for anything to come up on your screen. And of course, don't expect SSL support. At the time of this video, almost 52% of the web uses secure HTTP, otherwise known as HTTPS. So much of the websites you'll try and visit simply won't work. Let's start with the most simple, DOS links. As you saw in the Telnet example of the text mode web browsers, Lynx is a text mode web browser that's actually pretty usable. The interface in DOS Lynx is a bit different than its Linux counterpart, although it's not necessarily a nasty one. I found its performance on a 286 with 640k RAM pretty unbearable, but perhaps I needed to twiddle with the settings some more. There are some more modern browsers that are graphical. 
For example, Arachne for DOS, it's a thing of genius. It looks and feels like a real web browser. I could get in and run it on a 286 with an EGA display, but oh, it's slower than a geriatric slug on a salted motorway. I believe it will work on an XT class machine, perhaps an 886, but I'd rather stick Fox in my eyes than do that. Dillo requires a 386 processor or better, so I didn't play with it. Pah! The 386 processors are far too new for me. But I hear good things about Dillo, apparently its performance is pretty fast and it feels and looks like a modern web browser should be. It's still being developed to this very day. Quite unbelievably, there are a ton of other internet apps which are available for old DOS computers. There's an SSH2 client as well as an older SSH 1.5 one, an IRC server, various web servers and more besides. Too much to go over on this video. I've put all the links to all those goodies in the description, so be sure to view those. Well, that's pretty much it for this Al's Geek Lab. As always, I would love to hear what you think. If you've got any more internet goodness for retro PCs out there, then I'd love to hear from you. Or if you've just got any other hammy comments, then please leave them in the comments below too. Oh. And if you click on that subscribe button, it makes me pleased as punch when I see my subscriber number go up. Warm and fuzzy and gooey inside. So please subscribe if you like what I do. Until next time, have a wonderful lockdown full of retro goodness. Take care and be excellent to each other. Ta-ra!